being a distinct non-specialist, I've been trying to do that a little bit um, in terms of uh, how the wider Mediterranean, I mean, I very much go by Rajiv's uh, interpretation of where the Mediterranean is located. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but also to, to try to see the implications of uh, the long debate, if you like, uh, in the Mediterranean, certainly from the late 19th century on, the impact that this had on uh, the region uh, during the Cold War era, but also for our understanding of the Cold War as such, or at least my understanding of the Cold War as such. Now that I still have my notes, I, uh, again, I, I didn't succeed in electrocuting my computer up yet. Um, as I got started, just made the whole place very wet all around. Um, so I can start by, by pointing um, and I think I, you know, there'll be two parts to this anyway. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about ways of understanding the Cold War, going back to some of the issues that were there in the uh, excellent introductory panel that we, that we just had. And then in the final part of my remarks, I will turn to the significance that this has um, with regard to the Mediterranean, how to approach the Mediterranean, what are the key issues that we ought to be looking at, what are the, the contexts. Uh, the intellectual context in terms of interpretation in which these stand. Now it seems to me that we are um, really at a point of great transformation in historiographical terms uh, with regard to the use of the Cold War. And the panel this morning really reminded me of that very powerfully. Uh, it's not the end of controversy, but it's the beginning of very new kinds of controversies. It, nothing it seems to me is more dead at the moment in the historiographies that I'm preoccupied with than the early historiography of the Cold War. Um, uh, I won't sort of personalize this even in, in historiographical terms, but I mean, much of what was written up to 10, 15 years ago about the Cold War seems now, in terms of the general debate, um, to be very much beside where the framework for discussion now is. The question then seems to be that we are moving, you know, or how to understand them uh, towards new concepts and new uh, frames of reference. There is something very positive in this, because in terms of the division lines that now seem to break through, diamond, as we heard this morning, definitely on one side of those division lines, I'll in, in, in a second. Uh, but this is a debate that is. Uh, inspired, influenced much more by other disciplines outside history in the social sciences, not least by anthropology, <laughs> at least on my, on my side, and, and historical sociology. Um, it's inspired by uh, an attempt to take seriously uh, writings that are taking place outside uh, the United States of Britain, which I think is, is very important. There's been a sea change that's the influence of use on, on both sides of the divide, the divide that we described in a second. Um, so interdisciplinarity, international approaches in terms of debate have become much, much more important and it's some, something that we all should be very happy about. Now what are the two directions that, that seems to stand out to me and which would critically inform, I hope, much of the debate that we're going to have over the next couple of days on the Cold War in the Mediterranean? Well, you heard them outlined, uh, although in short form, this morning. One is that the Cold War was primarily, though not exclusively, a clash between capitalism and communism in the global north, with Germany at its core. That's what informed the Cold War. That's what substantiated the Cold War. That's what the definition of Cold War ought to be about. Uh, now, People come to this conclusion from very different starting points. Um, you heard Mark referring to uh, Jonathan Haslam's book, which I haven't read yet this, this morning. Um, and also, you know, there's work by, 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 by others who approach the Cold War from a much less, uh, if I may say so, realist approach than what Jonathan presumably does in that book based on his, on his other work. So this is, not, this is not about politics as such, I mean, it's even academic politics. It's about, you know, uh, what I call an essentialist understanding of what the Cold War was about. 
and which I then critique in support of my own work. I disagree with part of it. Um, the one that I adhere to is the second one, um, which really understands the Cold War as a form of continued colonial control over the South. Based on concepts of development as much as on military power um, and diplomacy. Uh, but with the constant threat of intervention, always there, uh, the threat of, of intervention on a global scale uh, from the early Cold War on, driven by the United States, but with the Soviet Union, as I'll explain in a minute, playing an important role with regard to it, particularly the latter aspects of the Cold War. So those are the two the volumes that I see. I mean, not many, I mean, not everything moves neatly into this kind of volume. But I have a lot of stuff thoughts. I mean, in terms of the new writing that is, at least the most interesting new writing that is coming. And I think we could be much worse than, than letting ourselves be inspired by the debate between these two directions. And you know, this has very little to do with how the Cold War was written about up to 10, 15 years ago, certainly in this country, uh, in terms of approach. Now, I think one of the key issues here, um, and that is the importance of what we're going to discuss later on, is the key imperial state asserted to me during the Cold War was the United States of America. Um, the United States had a role with regard to the Cold War that was much more significant, certainly for the South, than what the Soviet Union ever had. Uh, what happened on the Soviet side was that it became the other superpower. Although, in a gradual process, which I think we still do not entirely understand, using similar forms of intervention and similar stress on specific development and certainly from the 1960s on. And this, as someone said this morning, quite rightly, gets, you know, some guys who think in the same direction as I do, to locate much more of the significance in terms of understanding the Cold War in the latter part of the Cold War, what is that the origin? That, that's entirely true. Uh, because it has to do with this development. Now, I've spent a lot of time recently uh, working on topics that really have very little to do with the Cold War. So, uh, it's to some extent refreshing to, to return to these controversies, particularly in the, in the context of this uh, of this conference is particularly useful to look at the Mediterranean. Um, in part in order to dissolve some of the early approaches to how you think about the Cold War. Uh, because the periodization, as was pointed out very clearly this morning, I don't need to return to that, is different, as is the historical trajectory, certainly compared to the north of Europe or to the Atlantic world or whatever you want to term it. I also think, and this is in part inspired, as Nicky said earlier, almost on the work that I've done that has, has little to do with the Cold War, that you know, whatever approach you take with regard to the essentialist or the, some people have called it the conceptualist, uh, I think more crystal here than conceptualist in, in terms of philosophy, but anyway, uh, conceptualist approach to the, to the Cold War is to be able to operate with definitions. The Cold War certainly wasn't everything that happened uh, on a global scale during the period that we are looking at here. Nothing reminds us better of that than what the, the larger Mediterranean uh, region does. Indeed, to me, the Mediterranean is a, an excellent example on how dangerous, dangerous it is to superimpose a general westernized framework on other regions. Uh, one has to be very, very careful with you. So my key point uh, in the presentation today is that the Cold War framework, as we have understood it, within either of these two uh, directions, doesn't really work well for the larger Mediterranean region. Issues as decolonization, state construction, including images of the nation that we've heard a lot about uh, this morning, and not least the challenge of transnationalism, uh, limit the use of an overall Cold War approach to understanding the history of the Mediterranean. But that's not the same thing as saying that the Cold War doesn't figure in it. I mean, parts of what we are looking at here, uh, and again, this was pointed out this morning, 
was very much driven by Cold War concerns. My argument is that they weren't just driven by, you know, the involvement of the superpowers. Um, uh, Marx's ability to locate the Soviet Union uh, in what was going on uh, is, is entirely right and, 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 and well taken in diplomatic and military terms. But if you look at this in another one terms, and if you look at it in terms of planning or, or, or economic construction, then certainly uh, the Soviets are there in, in, more, in, more ways, in more ways than one. So there is overlap, significant overlap between the issues that I just outlined as being central. In my view of what happened in the Mediterranean during this period, and many of the Cold War discourses that were taking place at the same time. Now, let me try to look at some of the reasons why I find the overall Cold War framework, from whatever perspective you approach it, to be particularly problematic with regard to the Mediterranean. And then I'll spend the last 10 minutes or so trying to talk about links that are there. But one clearly is historical continuity or continuities that go back much longer than the Cold War itself. Uh, many of these have to do with the process of colonization and decolonization. And whoever well said, I think it was Rashid who said this morning, that the peak of colonial control in the Middle East wasn't the 19th century, it was the early 20th century, it was it exactly right. Uh, this is the period, this is the key period of imperial expansion, not least in terms of ideas and ideologies into, into this region. High imperialism, if you want to call it that, works for the Middle Eastern region more easily for the early 20th century than what it does for any, for any other period. And therefore, the debate about the significance of colonial control and anti-colonial resistance carry over into the Cold War period in the Mediterranean in a way that you see in few other places in the world. And we have a wonderful literature that is emerging on this now um, in terms of understanding how these link. And I'll return to some of that later on. The new work on, on Nigeria, for instance, points very clearly in that direction. Then secondly, in terms of difficulties using uh, Cold War paradigms for the region. There are the interactions within the region and with its immediate neighbors that sometimes go in directions that would not have been possible uh, by the Cold War framework. Think about the relationship between Turkey and Greece, for instance, within the same military alliance for much of the Cold War. But no one, at least no one in the right senses, would say that the relationship between these two states was created by being members of the same military alliance. Uh, it was certainly influenced by it in terms of how it was how it was mediated and how it developed. But the fundamental relationship between Turkey and Greece, constituted as modern states, was not what happened within a Cold War framework. It, it was coming out of the 19th century and coming out of the breakdown of the Ottoman Empire and its various uh, problematics. Now, finally, and this has not been touched upon, that surprised me a little bit this morning, there is the role of religious identities and how they have shaped the modern history of, of the Middle East. Now, this is, of course, a remarkably complex phenomenon, and it links to my earlier remark about the challenge of transnationalism and transnationalist communities in order to try to understand the development of uh, the period that we're looking at here for, uh, for the Middle East. But it seems to me that the development of religious identities on both main Mediterranean shores, the, the northern and the southern, um, is a, I, an issue of great importance in understanding the transition from the early 20th century to the, to the Cold War era. Uh, the fact that political Islam, Islamism, was very much formed as a Cold War instrument of battle against the left. Um, is something that is often overlooked in general Cold War historiography, but ought to be noted certainly in its Mediterranean sense. But there is also the other aspect, even less extreme, 
And that is the transformation of Christian democracy on the northern shores of the Mediterranean. And what that had to do with the development of a form of religious energy, um, situating states, particularly thinking about Italy here, but it's not just true for Italy, it's also true for Spain uh, in, in the, in the post-Franco era in the, in the, in, at the end of the, the Franco Italian, as opposed to what was going on elsewhere, uh, our ultimate threat. That's another lasting uh, connection that is, as we can see, to some extent influenced by the whole world, but it's also going on in a, in a much broader sense outside. Now, all of these issues do have Cold War dimensions to them, but they do not originate in the Cold War. It wasn't the Cold War that created them. And the people who are, you know, the essentially school that is basically trying to say, you know, this is what is Cold War, and all the other things are not Cold War, are missing those crucial links as far as I'm buying concerned, and, and run the risk of uh, an approach which, in the longer run, may, may turn out to be of less importance uh, in understanding the Cold War as part of 20th century history. Uh, much of what happened in the Middle East during the period we're looking at was fueled by the Cold War. Think of the Middle East conflict, the Arab Israeli conflict, but not created by it. Now, as you may already have gathered the Mediterranean that I'm interested in, um, or the zone that I'm interested in, is emerging very far from Eurocentric conceptions, mostly based on identities along the northern coast. It includes the Middle East, it includes North Africa, it even includes two Atlantic states that are not technically in the Mediterranean, uh, Portugal and Morocco, uh, which I think are of very significant particularly for those of us who have an interest in looking at the late Cold War, the 1970s and 1980s. One of the reasons why those two countries are particularly important in terms of my definition of the Mediterranean are the links that exist between them and Africa. Uh, the reinvigoration of Cold War conflict uh, during the 1970s was very much driven by the collapse of the Portuguese Empire and the role that this had, not just for Africa, that was more significant there, but for the global system as a whole. Likewise, Morocco, uh, from Congo in the 1960s and up to Bosnia in the 1990s, uh, supplied some of the front soldiers for American imperial control around the world, uh, in a process that's very often overlooked and still very uh, unexplored. So these belong within the, the framework that, that I want to look at. The history of the 20th century Mediterranean, as I said initially, is very much a history of colonialism and decolonization in a process that lasts up to today. Uh, this was a story, and I won't go into this, we heard a lot about it this morning, about British and French control and the breakdown of the British and French empires. It's also the history of Italy and Spain, although as Vicky pointed out, Italy especially being a late comma to the game, suffered the worst consequences uh, of some of its attempts at playing imperialism. But there is also a broader sense, which I think we need to take into consideration in understanding the historical processes that we're looking at with regard to empires. Much of what happened in the 20th century, in the Mediterranean zone, so developed out of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, without understanding the links that go from that and all the way up to the Yugoslav Wars in the late uh, 20th century, in the 1990s, we're missing a very significant part of the picture that we want to look at. I mean, someone said, uh, I totally agree with it, that not starting to think about the US-Soviet conflict in Cold War terms in 1917, uh, you know, doesn't make sense. I mean, clearly you have to start, if you want to have a period history, with the anti-communist advances of the Russian Revolution in order to understand anything about how that bilateral relationship works. But likewise, in the Mediterranean, you have to start with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in order to understand much of what happened with regard to how various players saw the Cold War and the, the, the implications of the Cold War 
uh, for them. Uh, and that process created disruptions, but it also created new links. Uh, think of Egypt's links to Yugoslavia uh, during the height of the Cold War. Crucially important, for instance, for the creation of the non-aligned movement. Um, linked, in my view, to how Nasser and Tito tended to think in very similar terms about concepts of nation, very much because of their sheer Ottoman background. Um, it's not, because it wasn't much pointed out at the time, but, but later, a number of people who are looking at Egyptian history as you know, new point in terms of political structures to the fact that the ruling dynasty was obeyed and had its origins in the Balkans rather than in the Maghreb or the Maghreb region. Now, even the northern coast, in my view, was defined by these processes of colonialism and decolonization. Um, Post-war France was very much formed in the shadow of the Algerian War, which, in my view, created, uh, more than anything else, France's difficulties with accepting some aspects of American hegemony uh, within Europe. The story of French resistance against American hegemonism is, in that sense, uh, uh, less heroic than it's often made, made out to be and less centered on the concepts of narrow national interest, uh, but very often, at least at its beginning, concentrated on the need to continue uh, to fight a war that was very unpopular in the United States. In Italy, uh, my Italian friends here have to forgive me, a bit depends on where they're from in Italy, I would think, you could even speak of an internal colonization and, and decolonization um, in the relationship between the North and the South that paralleled much of what was going on on the southern coasts of uh, of the Mediterranean. And this is, of course, something uh, that, as we heard this morning, uh, had very significant influence, impact on how the Cold War was perceived, the Cold War system was perceived within Italy itself. Also, I've forgotten, um, I know I'm sort of coming over to talk about uh, some of the key links as I see them is the impact of the Arab-Israeli conflict on the northern Mediterranean. Um, the Italian scholar, uh, Elio Denolfo, has written very well um, about this. Um, it's an issue of resources, first and foremost, oil. Um, but politically, it becomes a attempt at overcoming the problems that U.S. fought for Israel after the early 1960s created for Italy and France and, and Spain. Um, and that's something, again, that I think we need to Further. There are papers on that during this conference that would be interesting to discuss further. Okay, let me then end up by just drawing a few links between the processes that I have discussed and what I have called uh, earlier on the global Cold War. And let me concentrate on this very briefly on what I've come to consider when I was looking at this the key Cold War states within the Mediterranean. Seven. There are three of them Yugoslavia, Egypt, and Algeria. And I'll explain why these seem to me to be the center of Cold War states. This is not just a conceptual trick in the sense that I wanted to look at these and get the rest because they fit better with my story. I do think that they are truly important in order to understand these kinds of things. Yugoslavia was created very much as a Cold War experiment in its socialist form. And it came to be defined by the very peculiar position that it had between the East and West from the late 1940s one. Lowell scholars have pointed to what I think is a, is, is a clear fact. The, the, Cold War, the Cold War conflicts were in part what kept Yugoslavia together. But it was also interesting to hear what scholars from the former Yugoslav area here had to say about this what gradually began to tear it apart. And much of this had to do with the link that I mentioned earlier on. Tito's and the Tito generation of, of Yugoslav communists' definition of what the Yugoslav nation actually was. Uh, set within a framework that linked it to the Mediterranean. Uh, 
uh, that linked it to new tendencies towards setting up post-colonial states that had its own ability to act internationally outside the framework uh, that the Cold War uh, managed for the Cold War, the Cold War set up. So, Yugoslavia as a Cold War state connection is something that has become increasingly important to me as I'm now turning to write uh, again in, in a sort of historical fashion on, on the Cold War. Um, there is much we don't know about this, particularly during the latter phase of the 1980s, please stand out. But the work that's undertaken uh, in all of the former Yugoslav uh, lands on this now seems to me to be very, very important. And I'm glad that we have that represented for this, for this conference, particularly then for the, the 1960s and the, and the 1970s. So here it's a question of state definition verging on a concept of national identity that is created in a Cold War setting. Now, of course, in foreign policy terms, the significance of this was enormous. Um, no country was more active in Yugoslavia in trying to link various post-colonial regimes around the Mediterranean together. Uh, and the role of the Yugoslavs uh, in Algeria and in Egypt and elsewhere, all global, uh, is one of the things I think we need to think more seriously about in terms of understanding the Cold War with the region. Now, Egypt. I mean, be brief on this, because we touched on this this morning. In terms of concepts of nation, the idea of a new Egyptian nation coming out of the 1950s revolution, and the creation of a model of development that is socialist oriented, but also based to a very high extent on the experiences that one took place in, 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 in the Soviet Union, and indeed elsewhere, where planning was the name of the game, is something that is greatly, greatly significant I think, for the future uh, of the whole region, I mean, how the, how the region sees itself. Egypt, of course, was the key Arab state uh, within this region, was to them and, and is today, and the one that many of us were looking at. So the changes that took place in Egypt then in the early 1970s, or through the 1970s, were therefore even more important. Some people, particularly people from the left, would talk about it as counter-revolution. Uh, and to some extent, to some extent it was. But what was even more important about this, of course, was the new link that was created between the Egyptian state and the United States. This is the one of the problems, I think, in terms of periodization when we're dealing with the Cold War in the, in the Mediterranean. Egypt's changeover in the early 70s from relying on the Soviet Union to much more than just military supplies and move on to a close alliance with the United States was what created the regime that hopefully now we are seeing the end of. Um, but it was a period that was really connected to what happened in the 1970s. I don't have time to go into that now. I mean, it's, a, it's part of this discussion that we are now getting on the 1970s, perhaps as being as important at the volume. Think about East Asia, because we're going to that in, in the introduction. Uh, and parts of the Mediterranean, as the late 1980s was. 1979 as perhaps equally important to 1989 uh, in, that, in that context. And then finally, Algeria, which some people have referred to as the pivotal state, uh, the pivotal nation. Thinking among others of, of, of Jeff Burns, who is here in his book. Um, I came to the sense that there is no better country to look at, I think, in Mediterranean Cold War terms to understand, at least in my view, what this conflict was all about and what the links were than Algeria. Because the Cold War, as far as Algeria is concerned, is not primarily about diplomacy and battles, although it's not only shown in this in his early work. Of course, the what he calls the diplomatic revolution that took place in terms of how Algeria was able to deal with its foreign policy in the pre-state period uh, what was significant for how future anti-colonial struggles would be carried out. The real significance was in terms of development and in terms of development plans. And there is no better example of the significance of planning, particularly of Soviet-style planning, 
than Algeria from the mid 1960s to the late 1970s. What we often forget today is that this particular Algerian form of the plan seemed to be immensely successful and had imitators all over the third world to a degree that is almost unheard of with regard to other states who were trying to play much of the same game. Now, in my view, and I'll finish on this one, in my view, Algeria is really the key state to look at in terms of connecting the Cold War to what was on the Mediterranean. Uh, it's also rather typical, I would say, um, this was for Yugoslavia, of course, as well, that when the Cold War ended, the state project broke down. I mean, the significance in terms of that for understanding how the Cold War played in, in terms of matters that have very little to do with the general realist concerns, and of course the exceptionist concerns, uh, about diplomacy, uh, military affairs, and, and strategy, are more visible in these two countries than anywhere else. So I will end on that note. Look at where they ended up. Look at the longer trajectory with regard to these things in order to try to understand what the Cold War really meant.